My guest today is Himanshu Rao. Himanshu, how are you doing today? Pretty good. How are you, David? I'm a little tired. It's Monday morning. I just woke up. I'm still getting my bearings on it. So if I, if I say anything foolish, that's my excuse. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No worries. <laughs> what, uh, it was a pleasure to meet you in Downers Grove a couple of weeks ago. We're actually working together, but it's because of the environment, it's, it's, hard, to, um, it's hard to actually get interpersonal communication. Um, and, but tell me, uh, your role is similar to mine, but not exactly the same. What do you do? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, again, like a uh, principal cloud solution architect with, uh, Microsoft, uh, uh, GPS US team, uh, uh, as a part of my team, I, I belongs to Azure infrastructure stream. So we kind of focus completely on infrastructure. Within my team, everyone leads set of solution areas. So I lead three solution area. One is uh, SAP on Azure. Another is uh, high performance computing on Azure. And third is the Epic uh, uh, software on Azure, basically. So yeah, the three solution area I, I kind of lead actually. And uh, the the way we work within our, so we are just a complete partner focused organization within Microsoft. And uh, we do three things with the partner. Right? So, for us, everything is about partner success. And for that, uh, to make the partner successful, we do the three things. One is like, uh, if the partner is new to the Azure and they they want to learn more about Azure, build advanced skill in Azure in terms of design and migration. And uh, they also wanted to kind of build a practices in Azure. We work with them, we work with them to do that thing. And I'm sure you do the same thing. The second part, which uh, I work with, uh, is like a uh, partner has a kind of set of uh, solutions which they want to develop uh, towards the go to market and co sell with the part like Microsoft. And uh, I work with partner to develop those solutions, help them to design those solutions, architect those solutions, and kind of put those solutions in the marketplace, in our internal catalog. So. So they can go with the like uh, go to market motion uh, and co sell with us basically. So that's the second part which uh, I do. The third part which I do is like uh, partner has of course customers and uh, many times they are doing a pre sales with the customer and they have some solution in mind and uh, they wanted to review the solution with Microsoft or they wanted to co develop or build the solution with Microsoft. Uh, so I kind of work with them uh, in that capacity, uh, as well as uh, many times they want a customer and they have a project starting and they are doing architecture and design. And they want again to have a uh, me get involved in terms of uh, helping them in terms of their designing the solution, architecting the solution with Microsoft best practices. So I also do that part as well, kind of like a more co sell motion in that sense. So yeah, the three things I work with partners. Excellent. And uh, we're talking about what you want to discuss on this show. And you immediately said, I want to talk about performance and scale. It sounds like you have a real passion for getting, uh, building scalable applications for your partners. Yeah, that absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm very kind of like, Oh, uh, uh, I think I like, this is more like more than like a 22 years to be working in it. Actually, I started as a developer, uh, but whenever anything come up, at application side. Uh, so I started in uh, late 2000 working on VB, uh, Visual Basics of Microsoft and uh, uh, that sort of things basically. But then whenever a new improvement comes, so I kind of born and brought up in Microsoft ecosystem. So in 2001 or 2002 late, uh, when the .NET framework was released, uh, I was so excited. It was a lot of performance kind of like, uh, uh, features and capabilities so it has. So I was so excited about that. Uh, and then kind of like uh, I progress over, but then during my master, so I did my master's in big data oh. uh, and web science from University of Liverpool when I was in the UK actually. Okay. Uh, and uh, during that time, uh, I kind of like uh, learn uh, more about like how you handle the large scale data actually, right? Uh, and what are the challenges involved with the large scale data actually? And and the power within the data itself, right? Uh, 
and and this is where kind of sort of excited me a lot actually i was so obsessed one point of time about apache spark which is like a, a big data uh, processing framework actually and kind of like now it's not doing just a big data it also doing all sort of data but uh, but yeah so like on the time uh, kind of like i started falling in love with all the capabilities you require on performance basically and and then when more i progress in my professional career i also learn right that everything is about a great experience so whole business uh, uh, which anyone is doing with business you open a website or an app actually if you don't have a good experience right uh you you don't stay continue with that business more right because uh, you need a good fluid ui uh user experience uh, uh, interface but at the same time you also want uh, whenever you interact with any app or any 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 sort of website in a short time you wanted to get most of uh, more out of it right so you want more insight out of that app uh, more action out of that app actually and this is where uh comes where like a lot of data points you collect or you churn out and kind of like provide a aggregated layer and tangible actions to anyone to perform their businesses actually with a great experience so business with a great experience is most important part which i learned over the period and the same time uh, handling the large data uh, uh, and to achieve that performance and scale for that great experience is what kind of excited me a lot okay so what are the key considerations on um, uh, building a performant and scalable application. Particularly, you mentioned all the stuff you do is in Azure. About our, what are those considerations in cloud computing? Yeah, absolutely. It means like, again, I will be biased to the cloud side because I've been working on cloud for long actually now and mostly on Azure. Uh, but yeah, like I think uh, for, for, so for, for to start with, right, uh, the great experience, uh, uh, which is kind of like performance uh, is a key part of it, right? So you should have a scale in performance uh, to achieve that great experience. But the, more than that, it has a foundation of the reliability of your application, right? So if okay. your application is not reliable, then whatever the performance optimization you have done, but if it's failed and it's not responding, then everything becomes zero. <laughs> Even right? if it fails fast. <laughs> exactly, not Real necessarily fast. good. <laughs> Absolutely. So I feel uh, the performance and uh, reliability goes hands in hands, actually. And okay. and and to build uh, the so so the way I kind of see is like uh, both should be built in in an application from ground up. But same time, I feel uh, the reliability is more priority over the performance. So people should start with the reliability and kind of build a performance on top of that actually uh, though they go in parallel in many many cases so and 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 to to in terms of consideration to have a application more reliable i'll, I'll talk a little high level but uh, example you should anyone should start about performing the redundancy planning and we call as a failure mode analysis so hmm. You identify the type of failure your application can experience, basically, and what are the potential effect on on that failure, basically, and and more than that, if that failure is happening, what is the business impact? Uh, uh, what is the loss you will have in your business? That so for, first thing people should talk about that actually and start from there actually, right? And then once you identify that this is what is going to impact my business, then you derive, okay, so if I don't want that to happen, then what is my availability requirement? And this right. is how you define your availability from your business, actually. So example, what is your service level agreement? Uh, how fast you want, if the application is failed, how fast you can come back, which is that we call recovery time objective, how much data you can afford to loss, we call RPO, recovery point objective. So you define those metrics, basically. And if you are using a cloud computing, basically, then uh, you need to also see how much cloud is providing uh, those metrics. Like, so you need to build on top of that. So if cloud is providing a 4.9 or 99.99, .99, then 
Do you need more and build on top of that, right? Mm -hmm. So defining uh, your application availability matrix is a second stage in terms of reliability once you identify your business impact, actually. And then once you define your requirement or your availability matrix, then you kind of like designing the high availability. So now you start, when you start design, you make sure you have high available application to make it a high available application. Every tier of your application should have high availability built in, right? So from infrastructure to application, right? So example, you might be using some of the uh, cloud computing provided uh, uh, capabilities. Like in Azure, we have availability set, availability zone, which is like, a, if you have a application server, make sure you have a at least two application server running, and each goes in a separate zone. Zone is like nothing but kind of think uh, in a simple term, like a a building into a uh, setup building uh, into or a data center into a region basically. And mm -hmm. each of those data center is let's call as a zone, and and we have at least three zones for most of our region basically. And each of these zone has its own power supply. Its right. own polling system and its own network, actually, and that make that it's completely uh, kind of like uh, independent and uh, less kind of like down in terms of any. Yeah. Anything so zone A's out. power supply goes out. Uh, it'll only affect zone A. Zone B will continue to run because it's, it has an Absolutely. independent power supply. Absolutely. So, so you make sure you leverage those cloud provided uh, uh, capabilities to make your application high available. Make sure you have those pair of server going in that different different zone basically uh, and then also kind of like leverage some of the high availability capabilities we have at infrastructure layer right For example we have uh, kind of like a, a set of uh, disk redundancy set of clustering technologies uh, which can kind of like fail if one is going down actually right so uh, also, there's an application level high availability uh, with the replication technology of all the database. Like SQL has a uh, SQL always on. I think Oracle has a data guard. So make sure you have a infrastructure. Level. So choosing those capabilities like zones, and then on top of that, putting a infrastructure layer of the high availability capabilities and then on top of that you put the application layer of the high availability and application technologies uh, that kind of give a high availability to your application of course you also want to make sure you have a right uh, recovery strategy so even though failure is happening how quickly you can recover from your backup you have a disaster recovery environment in place so you go there actually right? so so I think these are some key foundation for the high availability. Again, continuous testing and monitoring is key for overall everything, right? Okay. Uh, so make sure we kind of keep uh, monitoring that. So that's like a high availability part of it. Yep. And then you build performance on top of that. Got it. We've talked a lot about reliability. Let's talk about performance now. What, uh, how do we build yeah. performance to our application? Yeah, absolutely. So. So kind of like, again, like designing a performance and scale for your application is kind of like, uh, should we start from ground up actually? Again, from like, uh, before you start design, you should start defining your capacity model and your performance requirement, right? Uh, so you start with the business requirement, example, uh, what is the type of content you are serving as a part of your application? Uh, out of that, how much content, uh, who is accessing the user base from where they are accessing actually, and 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 type of content you have some steady content you have some video content you have some uh, structure content like normal database content so you kind of identify those things actually, and what is the expected business outcome out of that actually. That's very important. Like, do I want that content to be like loaded in a one or two second? Is that my requirement basically? So kind of like identify the business requirement. What are the content should be surfaced in a stage one and stage two on, on the clicks basically? So you, you kind of like put that. And based on that, you do kind of like a capacity planning and a lot of framework, like example, SAP. Uh, we SAP is providing a set of... Uh, uh, tools basically which help you to define your performance requirement like there's something called sap quick sizer where you define set of user 
uh, how parallel users are accessing, the concurrent users are accessing, what application they're accessing, uh, memory of the data, size of the data. You put those input parameters, it will give you a performance benchmark. Uh, in SAP Wallet, it's called a SAPS, basically. So you have SAPS, so this is the performance benchmark. And that is the common standard across any platform. It can be on-premise or any cloud provider. And you take that and do the shopping for your cloud resources, right? So example, you choose a set of VM or set of compute resources uh, uh, base match with that actually those SAPs basically. So yeah, so kind of like choosing the right, based on that requirement, you're choosing the right uh, type of the compute resources or cloud resources is kind of like key part uh, of the capacity planning overall, actually. So yeah, so you define the capacity model and do the capacity planning. That's a stage one for any performance, basically. But then uh, to design the performance for your application, uh, I'll say there are two sub stage inside that. The first is like a end user who is sitting in a home or an office and from their device, it can be a mobile device, it can be a, a, a like your laptop or a computer, from there, they are, they are requesting your application from that point to the, the request is enter into the cloud network first endpoint. Right. So that's the first part, uh, uh, which is play a, a vital role into your performance overall experience. Sure. So that's the first part. And the second part is like from the first cloud endpoint to the actual application, which is getting like hit on your server or your container, uh, and, and and passing. So that's the second part uh, which you design together, actually, right? So, so the first part, like the network part of it, or the traffic which is leaving from the laptop to hitting the cloud first endpoint, right? Again, you, you need the network latency is the key part there, right? So example, uh, you need to start thinking that, hey, uh, can I move my compute near to the user? Is there a possibility? Uh, some so if, if my users are in Eastern Europe, for example, yep. Azure has servers in Eastern Europe. Maybe that would be a good idea to have some yep, data there. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So you choose that. Uh, also, you can double click on that and say, okay, uh, I have, let's say, in the East uh, US some user, but then I have some user in the West as well. And, and you normally don't have all users in one region of or one region. Right. Right, so you always have at least in one continent uh, all the, the user, right? So then you says, can I do further? Uh, can I? So there's an edge-based compute which is kind of emerging a lot, and it's playing a very vital role for distributed computing and performance, basically, right? So kind of like part of the content, can I move it next to the uh, user? So example, if you are serving, let's say a video streaming service, uh, then people are using a kind of like a content, content delivery network, which is kind of like CDN we call in cloud. Uh, and every cloud provider has the CDN option basically, which is nothing but a cache, a edge base or pop location based cache. For, for, for static content. For the static content, exactly. Uh, and it's not just a video streaming, but any like a media content you have or any other content which you wanted to. So yeah, moving the content or a compute near to the user yeah. is a, is a one of the key design principle to kind of like uh, fill the gap up between the end user and the com like cloud first endpoint basically, right? In between also, there are a lot of options you have for caching. Uh, so just not like uh, uh, unstructured or semi-structured data caching, but also structured data caching. There are a lot of cache we have in Azure Redis cache, basically. Uh, and the, also, you can do a like structured data caching on the on the, on the edge location as well, like on CDN as well. So doing that part of it actually. Uh, the second part is basically. If you have a user who is kind of like a more intranet user, can I leverage uh, some of the hybrid connectivity which cloud providers are giving? Right? So example, uh, if you have a people sitting in office branch location and, and they are hitting Azure, can I set up some VPN connectivity from office to there, right? Uh, which we call like a site to site connectivity in Azure right. basically. Or, if they are working from home, uh, we, we also provide the point to site VPN connectivity. Now this will 
not make your performance great, honestly, but it will still help because now you have a IPsec tunnel and more it's help in security as well, basically. But many times you need to kind of like uh, load a large amount of data uh, into, into Azure and, and you have a very short window, especially if you are going live, there's a production cutover window where you have kind of like, uh, let's say, I've been in that situation before even joining Microsoft where you have, let's say, four hours to move your SAP data uh, uh, and data size is like a one terabyte, uh, basically. Uh, so how you do that thing, right? So for that uh, that performance requirement for hybrid, we also have, and most of the cloud provider have a private uh, kind of van connectivity as well. Uh, so. Uh, in Azure, uh, we have the BGP tunnel-based uh, private connectivity called Express Route. So you can put that Express Route to kind of achieve that performance target uh, you have, basically. Right. And that's basically a private connection between my on-premise site and the Azure cloud. Yep, absolutely. Yep, that's a private connectivity. It is fully secure. And the good thing is, like the uh, Microsoft worked with the telecom provider or those. Express Route partner, and we have like more than 100 or uh, uh, 200 now, actually. And uh, and and they they have the co-locations basically uh, next to Microsoft Edge, basically. So so that way, there's a, like a very strong partnership and the participation from the both, and we get a kind of like a committed SLA actually. So example, uh, Express Route has a committed SLA starting with like. Uh, uh, one or two GBPS uh, to kind of like uh, 100 GBPS, 10 uh, GBPS is common, but there's a 100 GBPS option as well, basically. Yeah. So, so it's not just a private connection, it's a high speed private connection. High speed private connection, and it's very secure, very powerful, actually. Uh, in fact, many of the large enterprise workload, right, which are performance uh, uh, kind of oriented, actually, out of 10, like seven or eight use Express Route actually. Like in SAP world, pretty much everybody uses Express Route. Mm. So, so, so that's the one part of it actually. And uh, uh, another part is basically kind of like a uh, uh, second portion I was talking where uh, kind of like uh, how, how you design uh, from the cloud first endpoint to your application layer. And that area really excites me a lot, honestly, because uh, I believe uh, from like so many years now, actually, that uh, uh, any application which is the business critical application, and I'm going to say business critical means like even if it goes down, it's like a huge business. Uh, uh, that demand performance as well, most of the time, actually. Uh, so you, you need to achieve a performance but same time, you need to still keep that reliability in place because it's a business critical, correct? And this is what uh, 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 kind of like excited me a lot. And in fact, I started Microsoft and I started taking those workload, which kind of like all has a business critical and performance is a number one priority. SAP on Azure, uh, high performance computing on Azure and Epic application, which is the uh, largest uh, uh, healthcare, uh, electronic healthcare record uh, software, basically, yeah. uh, and and kind of that's so critical, and that has a huge performance requirement. It means like uh, uh, it's unmatched performance requirement, basically. So, so, so yeah. So, and and this is where the maximum uh, uh, work comes in picture, where how you design from that first. Uh, cloud endpoints to kind of like application layer, right? And again, we can break it down into multiple chunks here, right? So the first part is like how you design your infrastructure, right? And then second part is how to design your application layer on top of that, basically, right? Now, uh, let's talk about the infrastructure layer, right? So in infrastructure layer, again, I talk about that, uh, choosing the right SKU in infrastructure. Are you using a virtual machine? Then choosing the right virtual machine. Are you using a, a microservice-based architecture or a kind of container for that? Uh, or you're using a serverless. Choose everything has a SKU in Azure or any cloud provider. And choosing that right SKU is very important, basically. But at the same time, uh, you also need to choose your strategy to scale for every any of this compute layer, right? So example, you need to pick and choose the vertical and horizontal scaling. Right? And horizontal scaling is better in terms of- if Can, you, can you define any, those two things, the horizontal scale versus vertical scale? 
Yeah, absolutely. So example, uh, if, you have, if you have a set of traffic coming and you wanted to handle the traffic with a scale, you are scaling vertically means like the same machine, you are adding more power on the same machine, basically, right? Uh, so you're adding more compute, uh, uh, more memory, uh, and same machine is getting resized and kind of adding bigger and bigger, actually, right? Or same compute unit it can be even on container node as well, right? Uh, horizontal scaling is like you adding more in, sorry, uh, yeah, horizontal scale is you are adding more and more uh, compute node next to that actually, right? So example, in a container, uh, you have a container node basically, but then each uh, node has a set of pods basically, and pod is kind of like adding uh, kind of like elastic kind of like horizontal part where you have kind of scale. But then you add more and more node to, to kind of handle the larger scale basically, right? So mostly your application, like you have a web application, your front end tier, is always get horizontal scale actually. Uh, your backend tier, uh, which is database, some database support horizontal scaling. Uh, people don't uh, more use it. Mostly people use a vertical scaling like SQL Server or Oracle. But then there are a lot of database, open source database use a horizontal scaling as well. Right? Okay. So yeah, horizontal and vertical scaling, uh, that is the kind of like uh, how it works. and. This is what uh, people should be choosing. Uh, and I, I believe that if you have a massive scale requirement, a uh, horizontal scaling is the way to go because that's what uh, it can do. Yeah, with horizontal but, scaling, there is one caveat is that your application has to be able to handle parallel requests. Um, so you have to have that built into the code of your application or into your database. It has to be able to either shard your database across those or sync them across those. Yeah, so that's a good point, actually. So if you're writing a code, your code should have that uh, sense in, in place that it can do the horizontal scaling. Uh, and uh, uh, in a database, because new, people don't create a new database, so you buy a product or you right. use open source database, that should have that capabilities yeah. for sure, basically. And uh, also, like I'll add there, to achieve this horizontal scaling, it's just not only the software layer which we are talking, uh, but cloud provider like Azure has some auto scaling options. For example, yeah. in Azure, we have a virtual machine skill set where you add that into your, let's say, front end web application server, and you define that, hey, if this uh, any of this two node, if the CPU goes more than 90% or a a memory goes more or a number of user increase. So you define that uh, threshold uh, for scale. And if it is hitting, it automatically add a set of new VM, right? So, so using a cloud native capabilities for auto scaling, it's very important. Like all of our serverless uh, platform has automatic auto scaling uh, inbuilt actually, right? So, and that's advantage of the platform is a service, uh, right? Uh, so that's a, that's a very important part. Like example, we have a Azure Kubernetes service or any container uh, options we have like container instance or container apps has a inbuilt auto scaler basically, which kind of like uh, people should be leveraging there actually. So that's kind of like a kind of like uh, uh, choosing the right compute tier and then of scaling that with the vertical horizontal and leveraging or like auto scaler option of the cloud provider, right? That's the one part. Uh, but the second part is also kind of like uh, uh, the the in infrastructure apart from compute is like a storage, and I kind of say these things many times to my customer partner that for those critical application, and I'm talking about critical, all three critical application which I'm working on, like right, uh, SAP or Epic or uh, HPC, the storage design is a king actually. Uh, because if storage, in fact, a lot of time I get pulled into the partner uh, engagement where partner is facing some performance challenges or they're not meeting their performance targets. And when we do the kind of deep analysis or root cause analysis, we find out of 10 times, seven times there's a, there, there's a wrong design in a storage or there's an optimization in the storage which is solving the problem basically. Mm. So storage play a very vital role uh, into your application performance. Yeah. And again, when you design your storage, you define where you need a high-end storage, like a hot storage, and when you need a kind of like, okay, the storage 
uh, I'm okay with latency, like a cold story, right? Uh, so you define that, and then and mostly with the enterprise application, you have a what you call is like a Azure disk uh, become like a main like a four five share kind of like a main hot storage, right? Mm. So. And we have many options, like we are starting from a standard HDD based storage, which is like not a performance storage, but we do have the option for backup or the requirement. And then you also have, we have also option SSD based storage. So we have a premium SSD, uh, we have a kind of like a ultra SSD, uh, we have a Azure native file, which is a native uh, Azure service, and it also have the premium and ultra tiers. So I think designing a storage is very important part. And there are a few key considerations there. Again, I'm not going more in detail, but uh, it's all about three things, actually. Uh, what is the IOPS? Uh, like how, how many times in a one second application is reading and writing, uh, uh, basically? Uh, how much uh, is a throughput? How much data it is pushing and pulling in a one second? And third, which is most important part, actually, is the latency. Uh, basically, right? Uh, how how much it need to wait to read and write actually, right? Because you have a great IOPS and throughput, but you don't have a great good latency. Everything becomes zero again, right? So latency is like you know, like a hidden in a plain sight kind of a thing where people sometimes you know when they kind of like design the application, they say, hey, I have a fifteen thousand IOPS or like a sixty thousand IOPS, but then uh, latency is a seven or eight second uh, uh, or uh, sorry seven or eight millisecond uh, and then application demand is sub millisecond of latency most of the large application demand is sub millisecond of latency and this is where you need to fine tune the application so example for sap uh, sap has is a, like a proprietary database called hana database uh, and uh, the log drive which is even SQL has a log drive, Oracle has a log drive. So the log drive, uh, most of this database has a sub millisecond of latency requirement. And for that, we have many options. Like you can use ultra disk, you can use our new premium SSD V2, or, or you use a, a kind of like an alternative file, uh, a flash database architecture, which is again, ultra tier of uh, ANF. So you can choose any of that. We also have some, a booster like a right accelerator. So uh, the right accelerator is like a like a kind of like you know I'll take analogy of the car racing game. So have you played the car racing games? Which game? The, any any game which you are playing like a, for car car racing actually? I'm not really a gamer, so <laughs> <laughs> this is probably not a great analogy. I'm for me, well but maybe I'm my not. viewers are. <laughs> okay. Now I'm also not a gamer, but I sometimes play with my boys. I have like uh, one of the high schooler, and he's like being, uh, he's a great fan of that. And uh, uh, when you do the car racing, you have this uh, what do you call is like a, a turbo option. So okay. you're you have a car, and and even the real car has a turbo option, which will like <laughs> boost the car exactly. Yeah. And uh, and 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 in in Azure we have right accelerator. So what will happen is like uh, whenever the IOPS are happening, uh, it will cache the IOPS with the high availability, yeah. uh, and it's a free feature. You just turn it on going to your disk actually, and it will cache it. And you have your premium disk with like sub millisecond of latency. Basically. So so yeah, kind of storage play a very key role again. Right accelerator using the right storage skew. Uh, handling your IOPS and also kind of like using some other technique like uh, uh, data partitioning. Right? So you partition your data, you kind of like have multiple disk created, right? So for example, SQL Server, if you have a data file, just don't put a data file into a single disk. Instead of that, put into a multiple disk actually. Uh, create multiple drive, put a small, small data file there. You can do that actually. So that uh, kind of like uh, uh, help you in terms of the uh, for, for, from the kind of like performance side of it, right? Many times you have application server, you have database server goes in a one region, but the region is so big. Uh, the region is so big. In fact, one of the European region we have, like it's really big, like uh, in terms of like uh, there's a small city in the between the host region. Mm. So when you deploy your VM, so you're deploying your application server, 
you're deploying your database server. And I'm talking more in SAP because I know SAP more. But uh, uh, then the application server can go far from the database server. And there's a network latency requirement between the application server and database server. And this is where we have some features like proximity placement group. So proximity placement group is like, you put both machine in the same PPG, we call PPG, a proximity placement group. It's like a folder in your, in your laptop where you put two files in the same folder. Same way, this is like a container, kind of like uh, you put two VM in the same a PPG, and we will make sure from Microsoft side that you know they are near to each other in terms of physical proximity. Mm -hmm. And this kind of like uh, this kind of like uh, kind of like give you some benefit in terms of network latency and performance so yeah so compute storage and features like this kind of like define the infrastructure uh, kind of like uh, latency basically so there's a lot of options we're considering performance scalability reliability uh, which is good in terms of the fact that we have flexibility but it's also a challenge because now we have a lot of decisions to make uh, as to how we're going to implement that um, yeah. We're just about at time here. Before we go, can you tell me, are there any anything new happening in this space that you're excited about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like I'm very, so uh, like there are a lot of uh, new things happening at application side, actually. So I think we all realize actually that, you know, like uh, processing a lot of data, basically, right, uh, with the service, uh, like microservice or nano service based architecture. Uh, uh, there are a lot of innovations happening. Like now there's a lot of hardware innovation happening and the, all the like uh, software members or software product teams leveraging those things, right? Uh, uh, so example, uh, the, if you have a lot of APIs, uh, you're calling that across the world, there's a GraphQL basically, which is kind of like an aggregator uh, and query language for the API, which uh, responds fast API with the nano service based architecture, right? So there are a lot of uh, uh, things happening. I'm really excited about few of our partner because I'm from partners, I'm from bias to partner. So the partners are like making a lot of innovations, For example, uh, Databricks, uh, which is kind of like, uh, uh, kind of like our one of the partner and they have a lot of innovations on top of the Apache Spark. Example, you have a data lake and then you have a normal warehouse. They have combined both together with like uh, this Delta Lake architecture uh, where you have the you don't have to move your data. You keep the data in the same place where you have a unstructured data like videos or uh, uh, as well as the semi-structure and structure data for your data warehouse, actually. And, and this is where things get more tricky because uh, uh, this is like we are breaking the like uh, year, like years of like uh, traditional pattern and putting everything in together. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of innovations they are doing. Uh, they created this uh, Delta store, which is kind of like, uh, uh, kind of like keep that uh, acid-based transaction layer. So, so you have the data, uh, more kind of like a durable uh, read and write point of view actually and, and 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 but then they keep innovating on top of that for example even though you keep structured data into a data lake store uh, still you need to kind of like uh, query it more faster and more efficiently right uh, and this is where they also kind of like added this uh, Delta engine, uh, which has a photon based uh, execution engine. So I'm really kind of like, uh, when I first time seen before like in two years, I uh, was so excited about that actually, uh, where it do the, because you have every every year you have like a, uh, see, like a storage is getting cheaper and more IOPS and throughput coming. But 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 you don't have more things happening in CPU side. You still have yeah. your clock cycle and the other things uh, pretty much same like before five years uh, pretty much basically. So how you of more efficient can be more efficient there. So this engine, the photon engine, which kind of do the database uh, data level parallelism as well as uh, a task based parallelism. Uh, uh, or instruction-based parallelism, same time actually there, and doing more kind of like uh, faster processing of your query. So yeah, I'm I think excited about this whole uh, they call lake house-based architecture. Mm. Uh, I don't have any lake house, but lake house-based architecture where you are keeping a single uh, place for your unstructured, semi-structured 
uh, as well as uh, uh, kind of like uh, structured data, data which is can be coming in batch or in stream basically for AI, for your normal queries, for your application API, everything single place. I'm, I'm excited about uh, the future of the lake house architecture as well actually. I'm excited as well, and I really appreciate you taking the time. This is a lot of information you gave us. It's a lot to process. Uh, so I think people want to watch this twice just to get it all. Thank you for your time. Oh, no, thank you so much, uh, David, for inviting me to your show. Actually. Technology and friends are most important part of my life because uh, I have a lot of friends uh, and, and, and then many of them are very important in my life actually. Uh, and uh, I am so excited and obsessed about technology part and how technology is solving the problems uh, for, for the world actually. So, I'm, so the both things play a very vital role in my life. And the important part is that a lot of friends who taught me technology. So there is some relation between them as well.